Well, uh, all right. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you have had a great day so far, and thanks for being with us this uh, evening. Thank you, Ming, for accepting my invitation to give this seminar. Uh, I know that I'm not the only person who is really looking forward to it. With that, uh, we can start whenever you are ready. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, hello, folks, and welcome to this talk, uh, invited by Maddie. And my name is Mingjin, and I'm currently an assistant professor at Griffiths University, uh, Australia. And my research is mainly about time series analyze, uh, work neural networks, and multimodal learning. And in today's session, uh, I will actually give a brief introduction of graph neural networks for time series analyze, uh, together with some typical research works, uh, applications, as well as uh, some prospects. Okay, um, before we dive in, uh, we usually ask a fundamental question of like, what are time series? Uh, are they simply just a, a sequence of data points in temporal order? Uh, I would say yes, but not. And, and, and in fact, um, time series can be very diverse and may, may also encompass different forms of data um, in diverse domains. Um, and in reality, um, time series are actually you know, everywhere. And for example, the stock market data, uh, traffic speed, volume, uh, as well as the power generated records in a power plant or wind farm. And the data behind in these scenarios are actually the, the time series. Okay, so here I give a, a very uh, typical example of the standard time series. And formally, we normally can categorize them into at least uh, two types, the univariate and the multivariate time series. Okay, and standard univariate time series is actually a sequence of observations as we mentioned, such as the, the daily temperature um, in Melbourne. And for the multivariate time series, just on the right-hand side, um, on the other hand, you know, have more than one variable. Uh, uh, a typical example, like uh, the one, for example, the green is denoted as the daily temperatures uh, in the city, and the blue one is about the the the, the humidity. So um, these two variables here, in these cases, may correlate with each other. And in terms of we using the the graph neural networks, for example, to model a kind of multivariate time series, uh, we are about to learning the you know, in most of the cases, we're about to learning their um, correlations, or we say the special uh, dependencies uh, between different variables here. Okay, uh, now we talk a bit about the, the graph structure data. So um, the first question is how we define this data type. And in reality, uh, there are many graph instances, such as the citation network, Right, like in this case, it's the nodes and edges are articles and their citation relationships. And another example is the knowledge graph. So where nodes are different entities and the edges are their actual uh, relations. So for example, um, the one entity could be a location like friends and another uh, node could be uh, the Mona Lisa. So. Uh, we must know that the, the Mona Lisa, this artifact is actually uh, in France. So in France, uh, if there, uh, it actually the relations in this knowledge graph to 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 describe the uh, the connectivities between these two nodes, these two entities, and that's about the knowledge graph. Okay, and when it comes to time series, like we usually talk about traffic modeling, so this is actually a very typical examples, and. In these cases, we can say that uh, we can actually um, use graph neural networks to to model to model. For example, uh, if we got uh, 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 different speed sensors installed uh, on different intersections, okay, so those sensors could be the node in this uh, traffic network, and their recordings could be the time series. You know, the for example, the traffic speed or traffic volumes um, at different intersections, and 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 then we can use, for example, the the graph neural network based on the topology. So the topology could be the traffic network to model the uh, the dependencies between the different observations on different intersections. So that's about the uh, traffic modeling, 
And okay, um, now we can find that, like given a graph, um, it contains some nodes and edges. And the key idea here is like how we define them in a given real world scenario. Okay, um, now uh, given the definition of uh, the graph, uh, we need to talk a bit about the graph neural networks. So this is about like how we normally model the graph structured data. And on the left side, uh, we noted that like given a graph, uh, the task of the graph neural network is to learn its node representations. And note that we can also transform this into the graph level representations. Uh, for example, with the pooling operators, or we can learn the age level representation as well. Uh, but in most of the cases, uh, node representation are actually what we need, and especially in terms of the uh, in terms of modeling time series. And on the right hand side, um, I illustrate a typical mechanism of the uh, the spatial genome, which is called the message passing. And in high level, this is about aggregating the surrounding information to update the self information of a target node. So, um, for example. Uh, given a target node A, we first aggregate the information from its first order neighbor, B, C, and D, right? So in this example, and after this, um, for uh, for node B, C, and D, uh, we aggregate their immediate, we aggregate the information from their immediate na na neighbors. So which are actually the second order neighbors of the target node A. So uh, for example, the immediate neighbor for node B could be A and C, right? So for example, C, C would be the, the second order of the node A, but it's also the first first order neighbor of our target node A. So uh, the, the, you know, the, the flat eight version of this topology is illustrated here. Okay, so this is just a toy example of the message passing, so which is very straightforward and makes sense in many reward scenarios, such as the traffic modeling, like the adjacent node usually shared certain um, patterns. For example, one road is congested, and we expect that, for example, the, the, the directly link, the directly connected roads may congest it as well. So that's what the case is in the reward traffic modeling uh, applications. And another Example could be the disease propagation, right? Like uh, the, the the spread of the virus. Uh, one city got many people in, uh, infected. We could forecast that, that the adjacent city may have a lot of people infected as well. So that's it called the propagation. And uh, these two typical uh, scenarios are actually the shared certain concepts similar to the message passing. So that's about the spatial graph neural networks. And when we model the, the graph structure data, uh, spectral genius are actually another tool that we can use. Okay, so you know that message passing is essentially uh, a special case of the graph spectral theory. And generally speak, uh, speaking, uh, spectral genius allow to model not only the low pass, but also the information in other bands for a given attributed graph. Okay, so uh, the key idea is like we learn the filters in the spectral domain uh, to filter the information before casting this information back to the original graph domain. So that's about the key idea of the, uh, the spectral graph neural networks. And due to time reason, I may not be able to talk too much about the spectral genes in, in details today, but I will leave this to who may uh, interest. So the key here is to, in terms of modeling the time series, both spatial and spectral genes can be leveraged. And now we uh, we introduce the, the core concept today, uh, the graph neural networks for, for time series. And there were normally two cases. Uh, the first one is about modeling a univariate time series with graph neural networks. And here the first question is like how to transform a univariate time series into a graph, okay? So on the life design side, we, we illustrate a, a method, it's called the series set uh, at graph. So um, we're different. So in this case, is, um, different patches are attributed or abstracted at different nodes and their underlying relations 
and corresponding patterns is actually what we wish to model with the graph neural network. So it's known as the uh, temporal dependencies or, or patterns. And another case is, is about modeling the multivariate time series with the graph neural network. So here we treat different variables in this multivariate time series as nodes. And um, in this case, uh, we introduce the graph neural network to model to model what to uh, to model their underlying spatial dependencies, and we use some temporal models such as the 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 RNNs or the CNNs to model the intra series uh, temporal de uh, dependencies. So we can find that uh, the second case is actually more common in the real world usage where we model beyond the temporal dependencies in the universe scenario. Okay. So um, can, I ask a, can I ask a question here? Yes, please. So uh, can you explain one more time what is meant by series as graph? I guess I did not quite understand how you will convert a univariate time series. How, will, how you will represent a univariate time series on a graph? That part, okay. I, guess I could think not quite. Okay, so uh, in terms of the univariate, uh, what do you actually wish to model is the, uh, the temporal dependencies in this time series, right? So the series as graph is about to, firstly, you can separate different sheetlets, motifs, or patches given a univariate time series, like the yellow boxes here. So it could be, as I mentioned, a certain patterns. And based on that, you are going to model the temporal dependencies. So in this case, the temporal dependencies will be the relations between these patches. So this is something that we wish to model, but we don't know. And in this case, we learn the graph structures. So this graph, this graph structures, as we will mention later, it's can heuristic based or learning based. But no matter what method you leverage, you can learn the graph structure here. And by using the graph neural network, you, you are trying to model the dependencies between these patches here and that's about the temporal dependencies you are trying to what uh, you, you are you are trying to discover so this is about like how we use the graph neural network to model a universal time series and this is more common in in in, in learning the the representation of the entire series for example to do the classification so this is more common in that scenario Okay, and will I still have if I want to convert if I want to represent a univariate time series on a graph? Will I still have diff multiple nodes? You still have multiple nodes. So in this case, the node will be so. Given the example here, for example, we can have three different ship leads. Okay, and here, three different nodes. And we're trying to use the genes to model their relations between these nodes. So that's about the temporal dependencies. And each node will represent a different range of types. Yes, it really depends. So it could be ship leads. So ship leads could be certain motifs or patterns. And there were there were many ways, for example, in the time series domains to discover the motifs to discover the ship lead. And you can abstract a node at that. Or you can cut a given universal time series into different patches. Okay, so different in, in different patches, that's preserve the local information, right? But you if you want to learn the representation of the entire universal time series, you are about to learn the global things. So that's about the representation of the entire time series. That is why you need the genes here. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is a very good um, uh, question and we will have some example later, like how in, you know, in, in real world, how we can do that. Uh, okay, um, here is actually an example about uh, abstracting a multivariate time series with a series of um, graph snapshots. And each of them represent a, a time step where nodes are different varied. And here we uh, have two typical ways uh, in doing this. Okay, the one is with fixed graph structure, and another one is with time-evolving graph structure. So, like this one. Uh, so, 
like this um, um, series of um, cross snapshots. So the underlying structure is fixed, but the bottom one, as you can uh, cite, you can find here, uh, the structure is actually homeophobic. And most of uh, graph neural networks for time series, I mean, uh, so far, uh, is built up on the crystal paradigm by uh, by treating the mo uh, the modeling precision for lower modeling complexity. Okay, but there were also some recent works built up on the time evolving graph structures for a better, for example, uh, modeling performance. And when it turns to uh, the analytical tasks, uh, the graph neural networks can normally do time series forecasting, uh, classification, anomaly detection, and, and imputation. And on the left side, uh, I provide an example of wind farm. Okay, and imagine that if, uh, if we have sensors uh, installed in different turbines to measure the generated power. Okay, a typical application scenario is about uh, forecasting the uh, the future power generations based on the historical uh, data. And on the meanwhile, we can also classify the power generation status in each turbine, such as the upward or downward, right? So that about the classification. And similarly, you know, anomaly detection um, is quite common, right? This can be deployed to say like which turbines are abnormal compared to other turbines. And the data imputation, right? So uh, for the data imputation, um, we're also able like to use the, the neighboring observations to complete for the missing data caused by, for example, the turbine faults for the easier or, or better downstream analyze that we may have. And this is just the four typical use cases of GNN um, uh, for time series in an application scenario of the wind farm. And you can imagine that like if we have, I mean, in the real world, we actually have many similar cases uh, that we can mimic the usage uh, in this scenario or in this example. Okay, and when we um, um, employ the graph neural network for time series, uh, we actually need to transform the, the real world problem into a graph learning or graph modeling problem where the graph structure must be provided. But you may ask, like, like not all time series um, data that we collected in the real world have readily available graph structures. How do I address this? So the question, like, now we have the question like how we can learn or construct such graph structures that we don't have so normally uh we have two categories of uh methods uh the one is called the heuristic based and another one is about uh it is to use that whatever end-to-end -end learning or other kind of learning based uh, uh, strategies so there were two types of ways we can do it and for the heuristic uh based graphs um there were four typical formulations. Uh, the first one is called the spatial uh, proximity, uh, where we define the graph structure by considering the proximity between uh, pairs of nodes based on, for example, their um, uh, geographical locations, such as the shortest travel distance between two nodes. Okay, so this formulation is about like how we normally uh, define it. And the second one is known as the pairwise connectivity. Right, where the graph structure is actually determined by the connectivity between two nodes, such as whether the, whether the, um, an example it could be like whether two nodes are directly linked or not, like in this uh, in, in in this formulation. So if we i and we j, so the two nodes are directly linked, then this entry in the adjacency matrix could be one, otherwise zero. So that's two, the first two typical ways to do that. And furthermore, we, uh, you know, the third one, the third method uh, we normally use is called the pairwise uh, similarity. So where we build the graph by connecting nodes with similar attributes. Okay, and in these cases, we can use, for example, the cosine similarities to measure um, um, uh, the, 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 the two nodes. So the two nodes here, this could be, for example, two variables in a multivariate time series. We can use certain similarity metrics to do that. That's also feasible. And the last one is the functional dependencies, right? So um, this is actually defined the graph structures based on certain functional dependencies, such as 
uh, uh, the director causal relationships or dependencies from the common hidden factors. So there were typical ways to do that. Like we can use the Granger causality. We can use. We can also use other te uh, techniques such as the chain for entropy or the DPLI. So both of them are actually a kind of function, a functional dependency that we can use to build the unknown adjacency matrix given, for example, a multivariate time series. Okay, so that's about the heuristic based um, approaches, but. The, in many recent methods, uh, the learning-based graph are another popular ways that we can uh, we can implement together with the model. Okay, so uh, there are actually two ways to, to do that. The first the first one is called the embedding-based learning. So such as the one um, that's used in a work called the MTG. Okay, so uh, the key idea here is like given a time series, given a multivariate time series. We will learn the relation, uh, relationships between different variables in an end-to-end -end manner, right? And in these cases, we will have two embedding node embeddings, uh, randomly initialized. For example, uh, sorry, the EI, uh, sorry, the E1 and the E2. Okay, based on that, we can have two metrics, M1 and M2. Okay, so so if you multiply them, you will get a kind of metric with the shape of n times n. So n will be the number of the, the variables. And after certain activation, or we say the uh, uh, the process, for example, after the ReLU, you will regularize the, the value range between 0 to 1. So that's quite aligned with the normal definition of the other GCC metrics, right? So that could be the, 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 uh, the A, the, the adjacent map matrix that you learned with the model. But after that, normally, you know, the when, when it turns to the graph structure, it should be sparse. It should be not that dense, right? If if it's if you, we do not apply any, for example, regularizations here, uh the node will come, for example, in, in, in the in the most extreme cases, it will connect to the rest of all nodes. So that's too dense. So here we will use some uh post processing like uh, uh to pick up the top k connected nodes so that kind of specifications so both of them can be leveraged but anyway so this is the kind of embedding based learning methods to learn a graph structures together with the data and the second approach on the right hand side is is called the sampling based method so the key idea here is we optimize the probability matrix theta of a distribution, for example, the Bernoulli distribution, and then we sample graph structures from this from this di distribution that could be used in the graph neural networks for the time series modeling. Okay. Okay. Now uh, we introduce the general pipeline when talking about the uh, the genes for time series analyze, uh, and in this case, it's like given a multivariate time series, uh, we have a series of data processing modules. Right, like the, the graph structure learning that we just talked about. And then we can do some uh, uh, processing like data denoising and normalization through the typical uh, procedures we will do. And after that, we enter the, uh, the graph neural networks. And in many research works, we call it the spatial temporal graph neural networks. So here, in terms of the model architecture, it could be discrete or continuous. So the discrete model will be the typical gene uh, deep learning pipelines or, or deep learning model that could be discrete. And for the continuous one, for example, recently there were some work use, for example, like the differential equations, uh, like the NOD, the neural ordinary uh, differential equations, use that kind of technologies to do that. So in terms of that, it's called the continuous. And that's about the model architecture. And inside of the model, normally, when we use the, the, the gene lens for time series, we have spatial module and we also have time have the, the, the temporal modules. The spatial modules could be spectral gene and spatial gene and right and for the temporal modules, uh it could be uh with it could be like for example the RNs to model the, the temporal information in the time domains, or we can use some free some for example spectral fields as we learned that to model the temporal information in the frequency domain. So that's about two typical modules together with the model architectures. We will discuss this uh, in uh, the later slides. And 
And after that, we normally have the representations for each of the variables. And then we can do downstream tasks like forecasting, classification, et cetera. So you can have your prediction. So that is the general pipeline. So using genius for time series. And here are two taxonomies we, we introduced. Okay, so the left side is the kind of task oriented uh, taxonomy of genome for time series. So here we have four axes. So the one is forecasting. Uh, in forecasting, we can do, for example, the multi step or single step forecasting. And in most cases, uh, we consider this one the multi step uh, forecasting. And in, in that, uh, we can do short term, we can do long term. So that about the different tasks uh, involved when you when we talk about gene of the time series. But we can also do, as I mentioned earlier, we can also do classification, right? You can do multivariate or univariate and several uh, methodologies can be used. Like we just talk about series as node and furthermore, we can do series as graph. Um, we'll discuss this later as well. So that about the classification. And for the anomaly detection, Okay, so different discrepancies can be used, like to dis to distinguish whether node is or whether kind of time series or observation is of, is uh, anomaly or not. So here it could be we could come we could use metrics like reconstruction discrepancy. We could also use for past discrepancy or relational discrepancy. But whatever discrepancy are used, it's about to dis dis um discriminate between the normal and uh, and abnormal observations okay and for the imputation we can do in sample we can do out of sample imputation and it could be deterministic or probabilistic okay so that's about the overview of the task that that, that may involve when we when we use genome for time series and for the um the methodology oriented taxonomy uh as mentioned uh, we talk about the architecture and then we talk about two typical modules, the temporal module and spatial, uh, spatial modules. And for each of them, we have different branches, we have different classifications. So um, let's let's dive into um, uh, these two taxonomies in the in, in the in, in the in the following uh, examples. Okay, so uh, sorry, yes, sorry, I ask you. there was a question, there's a question in the chat from mm -hmm. Lusan. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, please feel free to ask questions whenever you have it. If you write it down in the chat, I'm also happy to read the question for you, whatever works best. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is burn distribution learned in any manner for sampling based learner learning or fixed during training? So the question is about the graph structure learning, right? Yeah, it's for slide 15. Bernoulli, okay. Is Bernoulli distribution learned in any manner for sampling based learning or fixed during training? That is the question. Okay. So uh, when we, so I think it should be here, right? Okay. So slide if you can. 15, I think. 15? Could it be this one? No, I don't, 14, uh, I think. 14, 14, sorry. Yes, so for this one, actually this parameter, you know, in terms of the graph structure um, learning, this parameter in the distribution is actually what you are trying to optimize through the model training. Okay, so this is dynamically adjusted. And for each of the observation, you 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 do the the faithful uh you, you do the forward process. And after um uh, the distribution characterized by these parameters, you can do the sampling. You can have this, for example, the sampled graph A. So these graph structures it can be used on the bottom line of the processing. For example, uh, you have a recurrent graph convolution operation, and it requires a graph structure. It will it will be used here in these purple blocks. So this is how this, for example, the GTF this work works in uh, the, the 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 real world when we implement it. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I will keep going. Okay. So uh, now uh, let's have a look of four categories of graph neural network for uh, time series analyze. 
Okay, so the first one is about the time series forecasting, right? Like given like historical observations, we do the um, a kind of embedding, we embed in those uh, observations, and then we whatever define or learn the graph structures that denoted here. Then we have a gene and define, and we got the node level representations. We can use the kind of forecasting hat to do the predictions, and we minimize this forecasting loss to get compared with the ground truth. So this is about the forecasting. Okay, and for the classification here, uh, as you may find that there are two typical ways to do that. When we talk about the univariate, so it's quite similar like what what I have mentioned. So you can transform a kind of uh, a, a given univariate time series into the graph. And after that, you use the graph, graph neural networks to obtain ideally the node level embeddings. And after putting operations here, you can have the representation of this input time series and put that into a classifier. You have the uh, predicted labels y hat, and then you minimize the discrepancy with the ground truth. So this is about the univariate classification. And when it turns to the multivariate uh, uh, time series, like for for example, the you got multiple univariate time series here. For this example, you can uh, abstract each of them as the node. So it's called the series as node. Okay, and after that, again, you apply the, the graph theory networks. You actually can use the genes to capture the interconnections between these different time series. And again, you can have the, for example, if your target series would be this one, the green one, you can have the the representation of this time series. And you put it to the classifier, you minimize the, your prediction, the, the you minimize the discrepancy between your predictions and the ground truth. So that is about the classification. Okay, and for time series anomaly detections, we, we normally consider uh, serial discrepancies as, as I just mentioned. And in these cases, again, so the, uh, uh, like given a, a, a series of uh, historical observations, uh, after the, uh, the genius, we can have the representation, right? And then we talk about the reconstruction. So when we, when we, when we have the reconstruction modules, we can reconstruct, for example, the graph structures. And we can also reconstruct the attributed information, like the, uh, for example, the, the 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 time series that you pro provided. So this is called the uh, the reconstruction um, discrepancies. And when it turns to the graph structure, like you could compare with the the ground troops with the the original graph, graph graph structures that you put into the graph neural networks, and this could be the relational discrepancy. So this is just a typical example, like when we build a anomaly detection model with the gene, and what kind of objective that we can design. Okay, and when we uh, talk about the, the gene for time series imputation, the given time series could be incomplete. There were some missing data. And, but the benefit is that with the message passing, you can actually use the neighboring information as the, as the anchors to to fill the missing information here. And after that, we whatever the missing information you you may have like this, you can actually get the representation for each of the nodes. And then with the predictors, you can try to reconstruct, reconstruct those missing parts in the given observations. And this imputation loss is actually what you are trying to uh, minimize. So that is the four typical cases about the time series analyzed with the graph neural networks. Okay, now we um, we we have a look of the forecasting, and uh, when we talk about the forecasting, we normally consider three uh, dimensions. The first one is modeling the intervariable dependencies. So here we can use the dimension spectral or spatial genes, or both of them. And in terms to the modeling of the intertemporal dependencies, uh, we could use we could do this, for example, in both in time or and frequency domains okay and typical models like recurrent neural network uh convolution uh neural networks or attention models both of them it can be leveraged and for the architecture fusion uh, discrete or continuous neural architectures are both ac acceptable okay so it's it's about like how you can integrate the uh, the spatial modules and the the temporal modules okay so that's the high level 
uh, things when we design the uh, the general models for time series forecasting. And here is the uh, summary of the recent works from the 2018 to uh, the 2023. So here are, th are some very representative works. So uh, for the task S and L denote short-term and long-term forecasting, and for uh, the architecture, D and C represent, uh, you know, dis uh, discrete and uh, continuous. Oh, sorry. So D is discrete, C is continuous, and the uh, on the right hand side, uh, C and F it actually stand for coupled and factorized. So that's a different notations and special model is quite straightforward right like uh, what different gene that you may use it could be spatial or spectral and for the temporal modules t stands for time domain and f stands for frequency domains and different models like recurrent convolution right hybrid and whereas that tension both those are typical uh, strategies when we're learning the temporal dependencies okay and for missing value denote whether this method can directly handle the given data with missing value or not and whereas the input uh, graph and learned relations so those are about the graph structure learning like in, in cases with or without the give the predefined graph structures how we can handle that all right so, sorry, um, so can i ask a question here Yes. So these like the studies that you have mentioned here, they are all for forecasting. Now the question is, are they for forecasting problems where the time series has a special domain dimension in it? M meaning, for example, like the wind farm example that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, where you have wind turbines that are located at different locations. So there's a special domain in that problem meaning that location matters now for yes. uh, if there is a time series problem where there is no location in it and there's no location do you still see cases where using graph neural networks will be beneficial okay okay so uh and you can find that so for example the graph heuristics when it says something like SP or uh, PC or something, that means the given data set that may may not have directly usable uh, topology information. But you can use certain things to build it. For example, like the, like the traffic network, you can actually use the top, uh, topological information to construct the graph structures, and then use the gene based approaches to modeling that. And in many cases, it's 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 helpful. And this question is more related to 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 a, to a similar question like when we should use the gene for time series i would say in some cases right like in some cases you don't you don't really have too many variables and in that case it's channel independence with the standard time series model it could be work right like patch tst but in many cases like if you if you're working in this field you will you will find that many some traffic benchmarks like times it's got hundreds of the variables those var those variables are highly interconnected with each other with the interdependencies with each other and in this case it's using gene is it, it, it is beneficial because those because with with other time series model without considering the the channel dependencies the visual information were lost so okay. yeah so that the case is like when we should use the gene okay so, so yeah, so uh, the summary is that even if in a forecasting problem, you don't, location doesn't matter, meaning that there is no spatial dimension, you may still benefit from using graph neural networks if there is a high dependency between the different available yes. time series. Exactly, Great. yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh let's move on so here is some examples when we talk about this architecture right like uh when we talk about this uh the spectral gene and steam gene and this mess is a typical example and when we terms of the spectral gene in modeling the, the intervariable dependencies uh we could have a look of the dcr so those are very typical methodologies for the papers were, were mentioned here and for uh mo you know in terms of Modeling the inter, for example, intertemporal dependencies, we could use 
recurrence models. Example could be DCRN. We could also use convolution models, example, as TG said. And so this method we will discuss them later. Okay, and when um, we uh, we would wish to give an example of the attention-based method when, when, when modeling the temporal dependencies, whatever the, the pure attention or transformer-based things, we could have a look of the GMAN. So this is another method. Okay, and for the architecture fusion, discrete factorized method, example is the MTGNN, or we can have a look of the continuous coupled models, example here is the MTGOD. So this method are we are what we are going to discuss. Okay, first the method, uh, as TG said, so this method uh, is quite straightforward, right? It's, you should look it from left to right. So given the, the, the time series, it will enter the spatial temporal convolution block. But each of this block, it looks like this. So you can see it first had the temporal gated convolution. So this is to model the temporal information. And then we have the spatial graph convolutions. It could, in these cases, it could be Chepcon or the, the, the GCN, so different genes. And then have combo again. And if you have a look of this, you could find that the model architecture here is a very typical discrete factorized model. And the special module as I mentioned, you could use these two or other uh, genes. It's, it, it's, it, it's not that important, but to find the suitable way to model the dependencies between different variables. Okay, and for the temporal module here, it's used, for example, the convolution based. And this is this uh, early uh, work. Uh, it's called the STG thing and very classic. And another one is the DCRN. So this model is actually built up on a kind of encoder decoder architecture here. And given a time series, uh, each of the block in the encoder node, uh, as well as in the decoder, it's called the diffusion convolution recurrent layer. So the core idea here, if you have a look of the equation, you could find it's a typical RNN formulation. But the difference is it injects the graph convolution into this operation. So you diffuse them together. So in that cases, you could find the model architecture we mentioned here is actually discrete coupled. And the special module here, for example, it can use the diffusion, graph diffusion as the kind of um modeling approach to learn the, the the spatial dependencies and the temporal module here it's the recurrent models and quite straightforward so this is dcr so these two are very typical early works and I recommend you have a look if you are not very familiar with this field and another one is called the gman so this method is actually has um again it's based on the encoder decoder models and uh, given the time series here, uh, you could find that in the encoder uh, and decoder, it has uh, several uh, ST uh, spatial temporal attention block. So for each of the block, uh, if you have a look of it, it has two types of attention, spatial attention and temporal attention, and then use a kind of gating mechanism to fuse the information together. Okay, so back to the summary, you could find the mode architecture here is coupled, but discreetly coupled. Okay, so no, any continuous mechanism involved, but these two uh, attention mechanism are actually within a single uh, spatial temporal attention block. So it's coupled. And the spatial module here is to use the kind of thing similar to the graph attention network. So it's called the GAT. And for the temporal module, uh, it's attention it's attention based, uh, like the two diagram illustrated here. Uh, the upper one is for the spatial attention, the lower one is for the temporal attention. It's quite straightforward again. So um, let's move on. Uh, so uh, what the difference here? Uh, the difference, uh, for example, uh, let's have a look of the, the entire pipeline. So given, given input time series, you learn the graph structure, right? And then you enter the steam gene and block. So what the composition of this block? If you have a look, then you, you first do the graph for transformation. So that's about the structure GMM. And after that, you model the temporal dependencies with the convolution, the, with the 1D count. And then uh, you model the spatial dependencies with the graph convolution. So this is actually defining the structure domain. And in that cases, you can find that it's factorized one by one, right? Like first temporal information, then spatial information. So it's discrete factorized.
And for the special module here, it's actually used the chapcom. So chapcom is a type of spectral gene. So it's the spectral gene, uh, sorry, it's the spectral gene based model. And for the temporal module here, you could find that you use the 1D com, so it's convolution based, but note that this operation is, is placed in the frequency domain because you do the discrete Fourier transformation first, and then you filter the information in the frequency domain. So all of the information here, no matter spatial or temporal, are placed in the frequency domain to do the perception and then and then casting back to the time domain or graph domain. Okay, so that's the the idea of steam gene in 2020. And then once that through this, we could have a look of this very classic work. It's called the MT gene. So uh given that input time series, uh, it will involve the graph learning as well. And then it has a series of the operation here. Okay. Uh, but it's quite typical. So it's actually used the, uh, it's used mix hope message passing neural networks as the special module. And then it involves convolutions like the TC modules uh, with the, with the kind of um, uh, convolution with different kernels to model the temporal dependencies. So like one by one, so it's discrete factorized as well. And uh, that's quite typical, but uh, works in, in many, uh, in general multivariate time series cases. Okay, and uh, regarding the, because the previous models, most of them are actually discrete models. And when it turns to the, continuous models, a recent work, it's called the MTGODE. So this work, given a, a time series of the visions, it constructs the graph, and then it defines two continuous processing. Um, the one is called the CGP, another one is called the CDA. Actually, in the in the formulation, these are two different uh, neural ordinary differential equations, and you can actually wrap them in a single form, formulations and you solve that you have the uh, the representations of your input time series for the target variables and then you apply a kind of downstream hat for example the end convolution at the forecaster you can do the forecasting effectively okay so in these cases you can find that the spatial module here is the gde and the temporal module the gde means the graph diffusion equations and temporal module here is the temporal diffusion equations so that's a that's a continuous coupled method. Okay, and when we talk about the classification, uh, again, it could be univariate, right? Or the multivariate. And taking the the univariate time series uh, classification, for example, here we here the core idea is actually to transform univariate time series into a graph, as I mentioned, to identify the unique patterns. And for the series as no. Uh, each of the time series, for example, you've got a multiple universal time series, but you have one of them at your target time series. At the, at the example that we, we illustrated before. So in this cases, each time series will be a node in a graph. And then, uh, we can will, uh, uh, will the, 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 the entire thing that the kind of data graph. Okay. And for the multivariate time series, uh, the idea is similar. Okay, but there is additional layer of complexity that about to model the, the inter-variable dependencies. And here is the summary of some very typical recent works from 2021 to 2024. Okay, so uh, the first work here uh, is called the time to graph. Okay, so this work shows like how we can transform a time series into a graph. Okay, so um here each time series is actually transformed into a graph where she plates okay always see motifs actually form different nodes and their transition probabilities creates the edges here and after this uh we leverage the graph attention uh, network uh, along with the kind of pooling operators to obtain the, the graph level uh, representations to characterize a given time series Okay, and then we can use these representations for, for the downstream um, classification. Okay, so these answers are very, a, a question at the very beginning, like how we can, for example, to transform a universal time series to a graph. Okay, so this, in these cases, you can use sheet plates at nodes, like number four, number 40 or number 34. So those are two different sheet plates. 
to characterize the given, for example, a long observations and their transition probability forms a kind of edges in this graph. Okay, so this is just one example. And uh, another example here is the, the same um, TSC. So in this case, we are trying to build a kind of data set graph. So different time ser series from diff form different nodes in this data set graph. And by using the genome with, for example, message processing, we can simply obtain the target representation of a time series, like illustrated in this figure by uh, considering these and other samples in the entire data set. Okay, so this makes sense and can gives you actually a global modeling perspectives on a given data set rather than focusing merely on the time time series samples. And for this example, um, so this case is we we talk about to to classify irregularly sampled multivariate time series. So uh, in this scenario, uh, your obs your observations at each of the time step is it is incomplete in most of the time. So for example, um, at, uh, for example, T1, uh, you have the, the observation for node U. At T2, you have the observation, for example, for this node. But uh, the key idea here, for example, we wish to classify the, the, the entire multivariate time series to, add for, for example, survival or that's the two, the you know, kind of binary uh, classification problem. And when we have the observations, it will trigger the message passing, like the ring dropped in, in a pond, for example. So when we have the, the observation, for example, at the, at the TT, it will drop the map, it will trigger the message passing to propagate this information to the adjacent node. And then you trigger the classifications, like when we have the, the observations, how this will affect the, the representations of the, for example, the entire graph that affect the final classification results. So this is the ring job. Uh, okay, and for the anomaly detections, uh, I mentioned earlier, we consider different uh, discrepancies, like the reconstruction, forecast, or, or, or relational. Uh, no matter which we use, the key idea is to find the difference between the patterns in normal and abnormal periods, okay? And for the reconstruction, we expect that the reconstruction errors are low during normal periods, but high during uh, uh, abnormal, abnormal periods. And for the forecast, similarly, right? And for the relational uh, discrepancies, our assumption is that the, the, uh, the relationship between variables, that is about the graph structure, or, or we call the, the, the relation, it should, have a significant difference between the one that that during the abnormal period. So those are, are all examples that we're trying to identify the the pattern differences between normal and abnormal periods and dimensions. Okay, but you could also use use all of them. That's called the hybrid, or you can also define other discrepancies. And those are some typical uh, methods recently, and. Due to time reason, I may not be able to, uh, to to illustrate this in details, but I encourage you to have a look of our papers. So these have a uh, a very detailed explanation of this. And here we also introduce several typical methods, like in, in, in using gene of anomaly detection. The first one I'm going to uh, introduce here is called the GDN. Okay, so this method is actually based on the forecasting discrepancy. Okay, given a kind of time time series here, we def we first learn the graph structure, and then we use the kind of genome based method to do the one step ahead forecasting. Okay, and then we use our forecasted result compared with the ground truth. We calculate the graph deviation scores. So this is the kind of discrepancy uh, measuring. So if this gap is huge, I may guess that this this period is. Uh, uh, abnormal, otherwise normal. So that is the basic idea of this. And another one is to, to fuse different discrepancies in a single framework. So given time series again, 
like you got the encoder, you got gene based encoder, or uh, you 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 also have other kind of thing, other uh, other kind of implementations. Like, uh, you got an auto encoder to do the reconstruction. So the upper line will do the one step one step ahead forecasting similarly, and it's called the prediction. So this will optimize the forecast um, discrepancy. And the bottom line, it will try to reconstruct the given signal, and it will calculate the reconstruct discrepancy. So you combine them together, together with a kind of scoring mechanism, and you have predefined um, threading or, or learning based threading, whatever method you use, you can based on those two discrepancy results to calculate whether a given time point uh, is abnormal or not. And with this method, the GSTGL, so it's the recent me a recent uh, method. So this method have mm, the, ad the advances like to provide you with certain uh, interpretations. Okay, so the core idea is like given given a time series again we need to learn the graph structures and after that we do the one step uh, ahead forecasting so this is this remain a kind of forecast discrepancy based method and after that we can use the forecast arrows together with the kind of pce based scholars we can do the real-time anomaly indication so it's quite useful in the real world deployment like in the time you want to do the online anomaly, anomaly detection uh, especially in the cases with huge number of variables um, to indicate which variables is abnormal at the at a given time time frame, and after that we <coughs> could also to you know based on the school contributions we could also design a kind of mechanism. For example, in this case, it could be the root cause of normally diagnosis. We have these uh, modules to give you some reasons why we think this time series this variable is abnormal so this could be some uh, interpretation modules here so that is the CSTGL um, and when uh, it comes to the imputation um, so for the task level uh, categorizations we consider two of them the winding temple so it's involved fitting the missing values within the given data or we can do the out of sample. So it's more like extrapolations, like you are trying to predict the missing values in disjoint sequences. So these are two typical uh, tasks that we can uh, perform. And for the methodology categorization, we can do deterministic or probabilistic, right? So um, here, here is uh, a summarization of some very famous recent works, uh, ranges from 2021 to, to 2023. And uh, let's have a look at this work. So it's called the green. Okay, so uh, like given a time series, so blue is actually the valid values and the red, is, red are actually missing values. So um, this uh, process, I mean the upper branch. So firstly, you have a kind of spatial temporal uh, encoders. You do the first stage imputation, and then you can use, for example, another genius for example the, the second layer the decoder layers it's one uh one layer uh, message passing neural networks here you can do the refining so finally you got the imputed results and this is to do the in, in this in this direction but you could also do the bi bi-directional designs like this so the upper branch and the lower branch you fuse the result with the mlp together and finally you got the deterministic imputations Okay, so this is the this method uh, called the green, and we could also actually do the probabilistic imputation with uh, a model, for example, with the diffusion mo model in these cases. So this method will actually trying to use the diffusion models that's trained on a given data distributions. So based on that, we can sample. Uh, the possible observations to fill those missing periods. So this, so in these cases, uh, as we denoted here, uh, pre uh, pre STI is actually using the diffusion model for spatial temporal imputation by considering uh, the dependencies between different nodes and the imputation could be probably uh, probabilistic. Okay, so that's two typical methods for. Uh, the time series imputation. 
with the uh, with the kind of uh, genome or uh, technology involving uh, the spatial temporal dependencies. And when we talk about some applications, because it's more it's very important, like how we can use certain techniques in real world problems. The first one is transportations. Um, here I will not discuss too much because many previous example is about the transportations. It's 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 really about like how you characterize uh each node and their underlying uh dependencies and another one i think it's very interesting it's called the climate science uh because recently uh there were there were, there were lots of uh climate foundation models and uh, most of them, mo mo actually most of them they have not explicitly considering the dependencies between different variables so for example the variables could be the, the observations at different atmosphere stations across the world so those could be the nodes so imagine that if we can can we use the graph neural network as demonstrated here in these two um, typical works the one is called the graph cast uh in this work so we can actually use whatever grid or something we we, we abstract the uh, the things, the words are the kind of grid networks, and we we use genes to model the the conditions on each of the nodes in this grid. At the uh, at the things when we talk about uh, the the climate modeling, so this is the one typical ways to uh, to to do this task. And another one is the uh, the healthcare. For example, when uh, we uh doing the ecg or eegs different sensor different nodes here it could be different uh sensors and their relations are actually interconnected and we can and in these examples we can use the genius to capture such complex unknown uh inter and intra theories uh dependencies and then we can do the classification right like when we do the eeg you can have several diagonals you need to give some conclusions you can do the classification. That's about the healthcare. So um, another example, fraud detection. I think it's it's uh, very straightforward, right? Like when we have uh, transaction networks, uh, if one of the nodes is anomaly, so anomaly could be like fraud or something, and the node connected with this node, for example, the one with frequent uh, connections so that one could be you know in, in high probability it could be fraud as well so that is the the, the uh, very straightforward ideas behind the fraud detection using the genius in the reward and uh for the prospect because this field uh is growing fast in recent five years and in the in the in the near futures uh the pre-training and large models could be a could be a way. So recently, there is a work. It's called the UniST. So it's actually about the pre-training account of spatial temporal foundation models with a large collection of the data to do, for example, zero shot traffic prediction or other kind of tasks. You can do the fine tuning on different downstream tasks. So it could be one way, like pre-training um, a larger the universal um, uh, spatial temporal models or you could uh, have a look of the conscious language models uh, uh, especially involving the uh, the spatial temporal uh, interactions so here is an example of the urban gbt so in this work it actually consists of two things the one is if the uh, the spatial temporal encoders to embed the spatial temporal informations in the given um, observations so you got the embedding and then you inject that embeddings into your prompt you ask the large language models to give your prediction okay so this is the core idea of this urban gbt but you can find that no matter you pre-train from from scratch with a foundation model or you, you or you, you leverage the larger language models to do the spatial temporal reasoning graphs are everywhere so it's 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 largely involved in the development uh, of this branch of method especially in terms of the spatial temporal uh, learning 
And another one is about the data set benchmarks and the model scalabilities. So um, in I mean, in pure time series domains, the data, especially in this year, is no longer actually a critical uh, shortage that prevents the development of large time series uh, foundation models. But for the uh, spatial temporal models involving the graph neural networks, we haven't seen such growth. So one of the limitation could be the the the, the pre-training data as well as the uh, the uh, the valid uh, benchmarks to evaluate the performance of such model. So most of the evaluation recently remains based on those traffic uh, data set. So that's that's um, actually restricted only on the transportation domains. But for the other um, for the, for the other domains like uh, for example the climate or, or or financial, we haven't seen such growth about this, the available large scale and trustworthy benchmarks on that. So that could be one of the things we could work on. And here is an example about the uh, the, the, the benchmark, uh, the spatial, tem uh, spatial temporal benchmark data set, it's called the large ST, but it remains actually based on the tra traffic data. So that still has the limitation of what we have just mentioned. Okay, so uh, and for the scalability, that's about the um, the big data. So that's about the, for example, the volume of the data, the about the quality of the the the, the data, as well as the diversity of of the data we just mentioned. Okay, so this is also one thing that um, one direction that we could work on, and another one is trustworthy genes for uh, for time series, and in these cases. Uh, for example, given a kind of uh, network uh, trained on a specific uh, uh, data set, how we can believe that the prediction is, is truly reliable or not. So in that case, ideally we could provide, for example, probabilistic predictions to provide me with a kind of range that I, uh, that I can have a mind of how model are confident about its uh, prediction. Or in other ways, we could consider it some uh, security issues like attack or something that within a spatial temporal graph neural networks for for for, for uh, you know industry time series because in that case, it's the security is very important, and we could have a have a think of these directions. Okay, so uh, in this uh, brief talk, uh, we actually talk about the. Uh, we have covered three things. The first one is the taxonomy of genome for time series. Uh, no matter the general pipelines, task oriented uh, taxonomies or methodology oriented taxonomies, and also provide an overview of genome for time series with several typical books, obviously examples. And we also discuss several applications, right? No matter fraud, de fraud detection, uh, climate science, tra uh, transportation, etc., as well as some typical future directions that we could work on uh, in the context of the genome for time series. Okay, so um, that's pretty much about today's um, talk about this survey. And if you are interested about it, uh, you could have a look of the papers on archive, or you could have a look of our GitHub page because we listed all the resources, for example, the code, uh, the, the implementations of different methods, the data sets, as well as the, the, the collection of the papers for, for example, forecasting classification, all of them are actually in this GitHub pages. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. So uh, if you guys have any questions, now you can feel free to, to ask and we can have a discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. There is a, a question in the chat from a few minutes ago. It, the question asks, what is your preferred graph-based method uh, for forecasting stock market data and why? Okay, so actually this question, I, I, I encountered similar questions before. I would say stock market is very complex. Normally, it's hard to predict because you cannot, you, you actually cannot capture all the factors. So that's the high, high level answer, right? But for in terms of the genome for financial data, uh, as I mentioned, I assume that you are doing the forecasting. So there is no 
them up with to for example the absolute correct solutions to do that but it really depends for example how many variables you are going to be involved in if it's too many you could consider using some for example some highly efficient method because you don't want to give a kind of um delayed response especially when you deployed this kind of thing in an online platform and if you don't have too many variables you are curious about the precisions you could have a look of the most advanced method whatever like mtg uh, mtg ode so this method have a very, very strong performance compared to other early methods so that really depends on your need on your data set but in in general stock market is hard to predict i would say yes yeah, yeah, thanks for the answer. Another question that I have, actually, I have only one question left. So have you made any head-to-head -head comparison in, uh, for forecasting problems? Have you made any head-to-head -head comparison in terms of the accuracy between graph a graph neural network-based forecasting method with a forecasting method that does not utilize graph neural networks? Have you made any head-to-head -head comparison? Like to show which okay. one is more accurate and if the graph neural networks are more accurate then by how 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 much more accurate they are this is actually a very good suggestion it's about the benchmarking okay so in this survey we we haven't included such benchmarking but on github i would say on github there were there were some benchmarking like the one it's called uh, light test here or something. So you could have a look of that. So that's benchmarking the typical spatial temporal uh, genius for time series, especially on the realm of the forecasting. They compare the performance, the forecasting precisions in a unified protocol. So we could have a look of that, but this is, is definitely, as I mentioned, and the kind of prospect uh, is definitely a direction that worth to investigate, just like the pure time series because in the regarding the pure time series series modeling we have a lot of benchmark that's all, all the library that compare the performance of different methods with each other's in different well established benchmarks like whatever ETT weather traffic electricity on on, on, on those data sets but on gene but for gene for time series I would say no unfortunately but this is um a very good a very good direction to work on like you could have a paper for example we submit to the nips benchmark check so that that's great yeah but uh, thanks again for the answer there is another question it asks uh, uh, are there any applications for gnns in clustering for instance for network segmentation Gene forecasting. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. So I could give you an absolute answer here, but the the key idea in today's session is we 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 have full very typical application of gene over time series, but and we are not seeing that those full applications are absolutely the boundary here. You could use gene to 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 do the time series clustering for sure, or you could do segmentation, and it could be beyond forecasting classification, anomaly detection, and imputation. So for this, it is it, for sure. But uh, I believe there is application for genome to clustering, but not covered in today's session. You could Google it or, or find it in, in archive. Yeah, that's my suggestions, yes. Uh, so there's another question is there a particular reason to favor gnns over non-gnns non-gnn approaches i'm thinking in case of where we don't have access to external series dynamics is there a paper that shows the comparison this is kind of yeah i asked this game exactly i asked a similar question earlier so if you very want... good question yes yes so here i recommend we have a look of some recent papers. So if I remember correctly, this year, early this year, there were some papers in the archive which compared the genome-based approach with some time series modeling approaches. Okay. And in that papers, we may find that the genome-based approach with proper design 
it can actually have a very strong performance even compared with some strong method like eye transformer patch tst but you, if you need to ask the reason why so a very heuristic answer could be like in many cases variables have interconnections so they have some patterns that we, we don't know okay so in that case it's modeling the the channel dependencies you could use the channel mixing that's the thing we talk about when we talk about the time series models but you could also modeling the channel dependency with the GNN. So those are two techniques that you can use. In that case, I think the GNN will be beneficial. Okay. But if you see that in your cases, you have a multivariate time series, right? But those variables are, are totally not connected with each other. They are they, they were separate. So to validate this, you could put, for example, you, you, you select different variables from different data sets. You merge them together. You align the you align the time dimensions. If you use the gene, you, I'm not sure the answer, but you may find that the gene cannot provide you too much beneficial or not because those variables do not have explicit or implicit interconnections. So in that case, I, I assume that the gene may not work properly. So this really depends, but recent papers actually provide some comparisons like this, gene-based methods versus the time series methods and in different data sets with different number of the variables across different domains. So we could have a look at that. Yeah. All right. I, uh, I think with that, I think we don't have any more questions. I want to thank you again uh, for this wonderful and comprehensive talk. I uh, also want to mention that the recording will be available on the YouTube channel. You are more than welcome to uh, ask any questions that you may have uh, in the comment section of the videos or in the Slack channel, and I will do my best to address them with me. Thank uh, you, uh, man. Yeah, it's, sorry, sorry, just this one uh, last question. Do we need to yeah. the YouTube computer or int 8? Will be good enough. Okay, so normally we talk about this, especially when we train the large models, like when we train the language models or time series foundation models, we talk about the, the precision. But regarding gene for time series, I don't think there are too many, too many discussions related to this. But recently, as I mentioned, there, there were, there were there were more and more works starting to exploring this way, like UniST or other works. And when you train very large scale uh, foundation models with genes in time series, I would say normally based on my experience on, uh, on time series foundation models, we could use bfloat uh, 16. And normally we do not use uh, float 32 because um, it's overcating. And for the int eight, I assume it's on the Hooper one hundred, right? Or, or or other kind of the the, the the GPUs. We haven't we haven't do related experiment on that, so I'm not sure about the answer to this, but B floats uh sixteen should be she should be okay in, in, in many cases, I would say. Yeah. Uh, all right, with that, thank you again and uh... We can end this call. Hope you guys have a nice, have a good night or day, wherever you are. Thank you. And thank you, Maddie. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Yeah, bye.